Welcome back to ECE 320A. Homework five, as you can see, is due today. And I was hoping that you could get through the initial value theorem material more easily than the final value. That was sort of on your own. Is that a question? Yes? I'm going to try to record the review session, which is tonight at 5.30 in Harville, room 102, but that's a new room for me, so I'm not sure, but I think it will accommodate a recording, but I can't guarantee that. But I'm pretty sure I will be able to do what we do here in this lecture, and so I'll try to record that. But obviously, you won't be able to ask your own questions if that's the case unless you email me, but I don't even know if I'm going to have a chance to look at my email before 5.30 this evening. We'll see. Exam 2, hopefully I'll have a chance to create Exam 2. That's coming up the next time you come to this class. And what we want to do today is just very quickly review the process that we will use for exam two, it should be consistent with the process we used for exam one. It's just now you have one more sheet of notes. So you can keep that original sheet and now you can add to that. So if you've created your first sheet, you don't have to recreate that one. And by the final, you'll have a few sets of notes that you can add together as a whole. That's the idea. Today, what I want to also do is just finish up the final value theorem, the initial value theorem, and I thought we might work through a circuit example to help illustrate some of these concepts that will be, you'll be doing Thursday on the exam. And also, we'll have a review session tonight in the Harville building at 5.30, if I can remember. <laughs> exam 2. Chapter 12 is the material. That's the material for exam number two. There's not going to be any power, no chapter 11 material. There will not be any chapter 13, which is direct S domain equivalent circuit analysis. We'll just find the differential equations and then Laplace transform those and then deal with that analysis approach. Everything else should be okay with the exam number two process. You can use the front and back. If you do not have your Laplace transform tables memorized, you might want to incorporate those on your two sheets of notes. If you want, you can redo your first sheet. That's fine. If you want to optimize that spacing or whatever, but you now have two sheets of notes. You can bring a calculator, but nothing else other than something to write with. So you have some writing instrument, a calculator, and two sheets of notes. You have so much space to work on these exams that I thought, you know, we better not bring the entire library and uh, for you to spread out and try to solve your exam. Are there questions on exam two? Yes. The question was, will we need to be able to derive differential equations for an electrical circuit that doesn't look like a ladder? And the answer is yes. Please be ready to analyze any circuit. I don't know what I'm going to cook up between now and then. But it shouldn't be, I won't say anymore. So be ready. You can use a ladder approach. You can use mesh and, so you could use KVL and KCL. And you may have to use a lot of those combinations. But remember ICE and ELOT, right? And that's a way to be able to come up with the equations. You do not have to come up with one general fifth order differential equation. You might be able to come up with five first order differential equations. And in those differential equations, what are you looking at? And those could be coupled. And you won't have to solve for the first derivative of each of those. 
In general, though, what are you looking for finding your equations in terms of? Or how will you write your equations? So now remember Eli and Ice. And what's the last letter in each of those expressions? So Eli, I. So it's inductor currents that you're going to be wanting to try to write your equations in terms of. And if you had three inductors, you might have an I sub 1 prime, an I sub 2 prime, and an I sub 3 prime floating around in your coupled set of equations. In ICE, your last variable is E, which is electromotive force or voltage. So it's the capacitor voltage that you're concentrating on. That's what you typically use in this class, but beyond that it may be a little bit different, but typically those are the two variables that you concentrate on for your state variables or the variables that capture most of the information in your circuit. Other questions? So be prepared for something other than a ladder circuit to write an equation for. It could be a three mesh circuit, and now you might write three mesh equation, but it's in the time domain for this exam. The next exam will be in the frequency domain and we'll write our equations like generalized resistor problems. That's the beauty of the next chapter. You can sort of not have to worry so much about differential equations or integral differential equations. You can't wait. I'm baiting you. Chapter 13. You can start studying that Thursday evening. Okay. I would probably focus on chapter 12 before then. Are there other questions about exam 2, the process? And if you have some, you can ask tonight in the review session. Let's just quickly review the final value theorem, which is now stated on the screen. You want your signal x of t and the derivative of that signal to both be Laplace transformable. Really that just means your signal needs to be well behaved. So anything that sort of you could cook up in the lab is a valid signal x of t. But in order to apply the final value theorem, you're probably going to already assume that you have a capital X of S. You Laplace transformed the X of T. So once you have condition one, and condition one we usually just assume is true. There's no way of, ex of really checking that if I simply give you a capital X of S. You just have to assume that X of T and X prime of T are well behaved. Okay. You just assume that. Then the next one is the more important condition or constraint. And that says if I multiply this transform, capital X of S by S, now I look at the poles of the result of S times X of S. If that resulting transform does not have any poles, any roots in the denominator on the imaginary axis or in the right half plane, then you can apply the final value theorem and get a true and get an accurate result. You can apply this bottom blue equation as as you want, but it's not going to give you the right answer if condition two is violated. So you look at the poles of S X of S and you say, are any of those poles on the imaginary axis or in the right half plane? And if they are, I can't use the final value theorem. Is that clear? Here is a proof, and this is in the textbook. I won't prove the initial value theorem. You use similar things, and that's what I was afraid of, writing it before class, I, my resolution is much better, and so I can 
fill up more of the screen and then this projector restricts me. So I'll have to show you what's on the right side of that when we get to that line. But the top green is just what we assumed. We assumed x of t and its derivative were Laplace transformable. If they are, then they have these transforms that are indicated on the right. That's condition one. We now use that and we say, okay, let's simply look at what happens eventually when we look at the limiting case when s goes to zero on both sides. But before we get there, we have the Laplace transform of the derivative of little x of t. That's, cap that's s, capital X of s, minus x of zero minus. x of zero minus is the initial condition. That's going to equal the Laplace transform of the derivative. That's the definition. And the definition of our Laplace transform says we integrate from t equals zero minus to infinity of that waveform that we're trying to Laplace transform. In this case, it's x prime. We scale it by this exponential, e to the minus st. S is a complex number, so we are scaling that time domain waveform by this weighting function, a complex exponential, and that now collects all of this time domain history of the derivative of that waveform and boils it down into a frequency domain expression. But we don't even have to get that far in this derivation, really. We just take the expression. Now, what I want to do is I want to take that and I add to both sides of that top equation plus the initial condition, plus x of 0 minus, which gets rid of it on the left, and that's what's hiding over here. It doesn't want to show itself. It's, it's shy today, but that's plus x of 0 minus. I just added that to both sides. And now let me take the limit on both sides as s goes to zero, which now I'm carrying down what was in the right-hand side. And x prime, I'm just rewriting as dx dt, just to emphasize that the dt's essentially cancel. And when I let s go to zero, e to the minus zero t becomes one. It now has collapsed and there is e to the zero t. It's one. Now I simply integrate dx which says, oh, I have x evaluated at the lower limit and the upper limit. I then scroll down And I have x at time infinity, that's the time domain waveform, minus its initial condition plus the initial condition. Those cancel, and I then have that what I started with, which was the limit as s goes to zero of s, capital X of s, is equal to x at infinity, which is really just the limiting value of my time domain expression x of t as t marches off to infinity. The beauty of this is that you do not have to find the inverse Laplace transform in order to find the final value of the time domain waveform. If you've now analyzed the circuit in whichever way you want and you've now found a capital X of s and somebody says, what's x of t in the limit as t goes to infinity? You can say, oh, let me look at s, x of s. Oh, I can now apply the final value theorem because it doesn't have any poles where. Where do you want the poles to not be? They cannot be on the imaginary axis or anywhere in the right half plane. So the real part of s cannot be non-negative. You want S to always have a little negative piece in the real component. All right, let's now 
check our understanding of that with a few give and takes. Can we apply the FVT? I'm assuming you'll be texting this back and forth to your friends and family members. So FVT means the final value theorem. That, that's sort of known text jargon. Didn't like that. All right, so we have FVT, the final value theorem. Is can we use the final value theorem for this capital X of S? Why? If you look at the poles of S times X of S, you just have two, don't you? You have two finite poles, one at minus one and one at minus six. So you could use the final value theorem or apply the final value for theorem to that capital X of S. Can you apply the final value theorem to this capital X of S? Now, what you want to check is you want to check the poles of S X of S, right? So you can have a single pole at the origin in your original capital X and still have the ability to apply the final value theorem. So the answer to this one, before I started introducing the blues, not playing the blues, we don't want that. <laughs> Maybe if it wasn't me playing it, okay? And you don't want to be singing the blues after the exam on Thursday. So you need to get these questions correct. Does everybody understand that this one can be applied, or you can apply the final value theorem? What about C? Can you apply the final value theorem to capital X of S? Which way are the bobbleheads moving? Up and down or left and right? Or just circular? Pardon me? I couldn't hear you. My neck was grinding. Hmm? So you have poles where? On the imaginary axis, right? Or another way to check that is what happens when you have a quadratic? What do you want with your coefficients of the linear term and the constant term? Present and positive. And you do not even have an S term, do you? So it's not present. So boom, that one you know has roots that do not belong in the left half plane. And in fact, they're on the imaginary axis. And it doesn't matter if you multiply by S, does it? They're still on the imaginary axis. So you cannot apply the final value theorem. If I said, what's little x of t for part C, could you find little x of t? And if you can't right now, you need to be able to do that by Thursday. What is little x of t? You said you have poles on the imaginary axis, so what does that mean? If you have things on the imaginary axis, it's just oscillating, isn't it? And where it's oscillating is where it's located on the imaginary axis. In this case, it has a frequency of omega equal to 1, which is the square root of 1. So this is going to be, and if this, so that s squared plus 1, it says, oh, I have poles at plus and minus 1. I either have a cosine, a sine, or a combination of a sine and a cosine. You have no s in the numerator. So you should be able to factor out the omega 
from your numerator. And in fact, since omega is 1, it's easy to identify what that, how that factors. And this is simply your x of t. And what's that doing as t goes to infinity? It's not set, it's not going to a final value, is it? It's just oscillating. It never stops. So you can't find a final value. It's bounded. It's bounded by five. It's well behaved, possibly, if you're okay with something shaking, but you're never going to be able to find a final value. Yes. All right, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give us a C prime. I'm going to differentiate C. No, I'm going to simply say C prime because I have a D. But I think the question is, what if X of S was equal to 5 over S plus 2 squared plus 1? Because now what does that look like in the time domain? First, can this be Laplace transform? I'm sorry, can we apply the final value theorem? Uh, you might want to bring a coin Thursday, but I wouldn't recommend it. You want to be more positive or definite in your answering than flipping a coin because it might start rolling and I might just collect your coin. So you want to do more than a 50-50 chance. Now, if you expand this, what are you looking to find? That's a quadratic, isn't it? And what do you need? You need your coefficients of the linear term and the constant term to be present and positive. Are they? Yes, because you have an s squared plus 4s plus 2 squared plus 1 squared, right? So you have an s squared plus 4s plus 5 in the denominator. So you have a 4 and a 5. They're present and positive. So you know the roots of that without even factoring it, but it's written in a factored form, isn't it? You know now that these are poles at minus 2 plus and minus j1. And that corresponds to, I think, the little x of t that was being asked in the question before. So yes, you can apply the final value theorem to this. Your poles are where they need to be on S, X of S. If I said inverse Laplace transform this, what would you say little x of t was? That's just an exponentially damped sign, isn't it? Because I do not have an S anywhere in the numerator. If I had a 2S plus 7, then I have a combination of a sine and a cosine, but they're still oscillating at the same frequency of 1. They're both going to be damped by this e to the minus 2t. Is that clear? And if you applied the final value theorem to that, what would you get for little x of t? Zero. And is that consistent with this little x of t as you take the limit as t goes to infinity? Yes. So the final value theorem works. Yes. How do you know if there's a phase shift? The phase shift occurs if you have both sine and cosine present and scaled by the same decay. So now you're asking for C double prime. <laughs> I'm just playing. So now we have C double prime, meaning now let's say that X of S was phi, well, no, let me just change it up a little bit. Suppose that I now said that this is 4S plus 7. 
over s plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. Can we apply the final value theorem to that? I haven't changed the poles, have I? So yes, you can. But now, can you tell me what the structure of x of t looks like? Little x of t. Now, you have the potential of having both a cosine and a sine piece at the same frequency, omega equal to 1. Meaning, now, you have... Oops. It's the trouble with doing this ahead of time, but you haven't seen D yet, so you're okay. You don't have to erase and cuss me out for, right? You can do that tonight or Thursday. You can do it anytime you want, I guess. Just make sure it doesn't come out on the microphone. Okay, then I can't post it. <clears throat> then I'll be sad. All right, so what do we have? Wow, must be the day before, two days before the test, right? This x of s now will be some a times s plus 2 plus some b times 1. And the denominator is going to be the same for both pieces. Is everybody clear where that those factors came from? And we really already know what a is, don't we? A has to be 4 if we equate the coefficients on the top equation and the bottom equation. So we know that this one is 4. And now we know that we have 4 times 2 plus B equaling 7. So that B is equal to minus 1. And now we know what the structure of this x of t becomes. It's now 4 e to the minus 2t cosine of 1t minus the b, which is minus 1, e to the minus 2t sine of 1t. And there is our phase shift. We could combine this sine and cosine into just one cosine and our cosine then would be cosine of 1t plus an angle. Is that making sense? And if you wanted to quickly sort of estimate, if somebody on an interview said, well, what's that? I, I don't know how to combine sine and cosine. Can you just tell me a rough idea of the phase angle? Well, then you could say, yeah, well, you know, when I took 320, we had this way of sort of paying attention to this. There was my, woo, disappear. My positive cosine axis and my positive sine axis, I could step over here four, and I could step in the negative direction one, and here is my angle theta. It has an inverse tangent of one over four. And if I can now calculate that theta, I now know what my cosine only expression is, meaning I can now say it's getting upset at me combining this all the time too, isn't it? So here's my m, and that m is the square root of 4 squared plus minus 1 squared. I'm trying to emphasize where these numbers are coming from. And my angle theta, which is right here, is this angle that has an inverse tangent of 1 over 4. I'm going up 1. You can forget that I had a negative. I've already taken care of that by the direction that I moved in the vertical direction. And now that's my angle theta. And you heard the tone. It was off by a little bit of a phase shift. So we now have x of t. Rewriting that is now 
the square root of 17, e to the minus 2t cosine of 1t plus theta. And that's equivalent to that, and this is my theta right there. Does that help answer that question, how do you get a phase shift? So you get a phase shift when you have a numerator that really is saying you have both a sine and a cosine present. And if you want to work it to just have a cosine with a phase shift, then you're probably playing with the complex coefficients for your partial fraction expansion technique. Question? So I'm not sure if I'm quite understanding. Are you asking how do I know where those lie in the complex S plane? No. This is not the only way to solve for capital X of S, or I'm sorry, for the inverse Laplace transform or to do the partial fraction. You can use complex numbers. You can have complex partial fraction expansion coefficients, meaning you could take, wow, you're wanting to see how many primes I can, but, but this is now X of, I'm highlighting it, aren't I? But you could now say that X of S is now this K1 over S plus 2 minus J plus a K1 star S plus 2 plus J. And you would find K1. And then your X of T, you would know from the table is now 2 times the magnitude of K1 e to the minus 2t cosine of 1t plus the angle of k1. And that better be the same as what we just wrote down. Is that what you were asking? So you don't have to keep your coefficients always as real numbers. If you want to play with the complex numbers, you can't. But the answers will be equivalent. Other questions on this? Are you becoming experts at the final value theorem? What about D? Can you use or apply the final value theorem to capital X of S? I hear more no's than I hear yeses. Why? Because now if you look at S, then one will get canceled, but you'll still have one of those crazy poles at the origin, and that's not acceptable. It's on the imaginary axis, so this is a no. This will give rise in the time domain to a ramp in little x of t. You'll see a ramp and that's going unbounded. It's not well behaved, it's not going to a finite value or a fixed value. Questions on that? Yes? So now the question is, what happens you actually want, when you apply the final value theorem, you better not be getting infinite for your result. Well, no, you apply the theorem if this condition is true, if it's valid. Is S, X of S, does it have any roots on the imaginary axis or right half plane? If there are no such roots, then you can apply the final value theorem. And then you're looking at the limit as S goes to zero. 
So everything on in that limit better be well behaved. If you don't check the roots, then you're destined to make a mistake. So you need to check the roots because I could put something in there where one of the roots might not be present. And if you don't check, you can get a number applying the final value theorem and that number is going to give you the incorrect answer. You could get a finite number. Meaning, if we just went back to one of these earlier ones, and if you simply applied blindly the final value theorem to the C, the first C, what would you get for the limit? You're looking at the limit as s goes to zero of s times x of s. So now you have 5s over s squared plus 1. Let s go to zero. Can you see what I'm saying? Where does that take you? 5s over s squared plus 1. So the denominator is well behaved, isn't it? You plug in s equals zero and you get 1. So you're not dividing by zero, that's okay. But what's happening in the numerator? 5s, and you let s go to zero. Zero. So now you're getting zero, but what's this guy doing? He just shakes. So you can't just apply the theorem. The theorem will give you the wrong answer if, it, if those conditions are not satisfied. Is that clear? Now the initial value theorem is different. It's easier. There you really don't have to check anything. You just find the limit, and if the limit exists, then you're okay. You don't have to look at the poles for the initial value theorem. Yes, sir? You said wouldn't work at the end? No, the final value theorem should work whenever you get a, lim a limit on the time domain expression, let's say x of t. If you find a limit is true in your original x of t, the final value theorem should have been applicable. You should have been able to apply the final value theorem. So you sh shouldn't get an inconsistency in that direction. So you should be able, anytime you meet that condition of all your poles are in the left half plane, none are on the imaginary axis or in the right half plane, then you can apply the final value theorem and you'll get the right, the correct or consistent result. Other questions? Now you should have, most of you it looks like from your papers being up on the desk, you've already at least applied the initial value theorem. Pardon? So you want me to erase this? We have the same conditions for the first one. If x of t and its derivative are Laplace transformable, And the limit as s goes to infinity. So now we have, really we have this duality. In the time, in the final value theorem, time was going where? To infinity. And where was s going? The frequency was going to zero. Now we want the initial value in the time domain. So you would expect, since s and t are reciprocally related that you're going to have to take the s value in the other direction. So now you're taking the limit as s goes to infinity of s capital X of s. On number two, if this limit exists, then the initial value theorem you can use. You can then say that the limit as t approaches zero from the right. Is that clear what I'm meaning by there? So now we're approaching, here's zero, and we're approaching from the right. We're going to zero plus. 
So now we're looking at x of t as t goes to 0 plus. That's equal to this limit we just found. The limit as s goes to infinity of s x of s. And I'm thinking that a lot of you have already used this, but here you simply have to find the limit. If the limit exists, then you can use the initial value here. Suppose v sub 0 of s is minus 4 over 2s squared plus 3s plus 1. Now you can go blindly. You can just say, well, let's see what happens. Let's look at the limit as t approaches the origin or time 0. Whoops, that's not what I want to say is that I'm taking the limit. That, if this limit exists, is the limit as s marches off to infinity of s times v sub 0 of s. That's now the limit as s goes to infinity of minus 4s over 2s squared plus 3s plus 1. And as s gets big, the highest order in the numerator and denominator will dominate. And so you really have this limit as s goes to infinity of minus 4s over 2s squared, which you could say, oh, I can get rid of one of those. And now you basically have minus 2 over s as s goes to infinity. Where is that headed? Zero. So that particular time domain value for, let's say, little v sub 0 of t started at 0. Questions on that? How about another example? Suppose we said capital X of S is equal to S plus 1 over S times S plus 2. Now if we apply the initial value theorem, we're looking at the limit as T goes to 0 plus of X of T. That's equaling the limit as S goes to infinity of s times x of s. And what does that provide us with? Two of those s's can easily cancel, right? These two can cancel. Now we have the limit as s plus 1 over s plus 2, but as s gets really, really big, the 1 and 2 addition doesn't really matter, does it? s plus 1 is looking just like s plus 2. So now we have some big number divided by that same big number. And in this case, little x of t at 0 plus must be starting at 1. And you didn't have to inverse Laplace transform and find x of t and then look at what happens as t goes to 0 plus. Questions on that? You guys were having so much fun. Let's do another one. Suppose that I now have y of s is equal to s over s squared plus 4. Can you inverse Laplace transform that almost immediately? 
Yes or no? What do I have? Do I have an exponentially damped anything? No, because I'm missing that linear coefficient in S, aren't I? In the denominator. Where are my roots? Uh, where are my poles? And y of s. Where are my poles? Plus and minus 2j, right? So what's my frequency of oscillation? 2 radians per second. That's how y of t is shaking with respect to time. And what's the little y of t look like as a function of time? Since I have the s upstairs, I have a cosine, and the frequency is 2. If we applied the initial value theorem, What do we get? One. Is that consistent with what you get when you evaluate y of t at zero? The little y of t, cosine of zero is one. So we are getting some consistency, which you want. This is a theorem. Questions on these theorems? Initial value theorem, final value theorem. All right, let's look at an example. Other than that, let's sort of put all of these pieces together. Suppose that now somebody gives you the following circuit. And maybe you're in an interview and they say, okay, can you tell me a little bit about this circuit? Yes? Pardon? You have one store energy storage element, which is a capacitor, right? So you have one energy storage element. So you would expect a first order differential equation. Now, after this lecture, I want you to basically look at that and be able to say, oh, that's a low pass filter, right? We'll, we'll derive that and we'll do that maybe even in subsequent lectures. But whenever you see this RC, this is really filtering whatever you're putting in as the input voltage, V sub I of T. And it depends on it, how it filters will depend on the values that you go pick up from Josie at the stock room, whatever the R and the C are. That's going to influence the bandwidth of this low pass filter. Now, how do we analyze this circuit? Person in the interview says, Can you give me that first order differential equation? If you had two resistors, R1 was horizontal and R2 sub was vertical, you would go, yeah, I can do this. Who does he think we are anyway? Yeah, we can analyze a pure resistive circuit. Well, you can do that with energy storage elements also. You might say, okay, let me write KVL. If I'm writing KVL, let me just label a current and the interviewer is not giving you what the voltage is at the input he's just saying well, I don't I haven't told you yet it's just some arbitrary voltage V sub I so you say okay V sub I of T plus the drop across that resistor which the way that I've labeled the current is simply R times I of T 
and then I have my, well, I don't know, Tharp said to always write it in terms of capacitor voltages because of ice, right? So I have my capacitor voltage, V sub C of T. But this is not quite where you need to stop. V sub I is going to be a given variable, so you can't do anything with that. But now you have two other variables, I and V sub C, and somebody said it's a first order differential equation. So I shouldn't have two different variables floating around. I just need one variable, and that variable needs to maybe be there and its derivative be there, and that will give me my first order differential equation. But are we comfortable with this equation? That, that equation is true. It's valid. It's just now we have to maybe rewrite it so that we now have, let's focus on our capacitor voltage, right? That's the ex variable we wanted to focus on. And the current through the capacitor is the same as the current through the resistor. It's I. And if we simply remember ice, we know that the capacitor's current, I sub C, is C dV sub C dT. And in this particular circuit, I sub C is I, and V sub C is V naught. And V naught is what we really want. So let's just make those substitutions. We now have minus V sub I of T plus R times C V sub zero prime of T plus V sub zero of T is equal to zero. And that should look like a first order differential equation, right? In terms of V sub zero and V sub I. V sub I being the input, V sub O being the output. Any questions on that equation or where it came from? Now, that's, let's say, step one. Or I might on the exam say, give me the differential or governing differential equations of this circuit. And that's what you would give me for this particular circuit. Obviously, it'll be a little more complicated probably on the exam. It'll have maybe 10 energy storage elements. Oh, some of you laugh. <laughs> if I gave you a circuit with 10 energy storage elements, then you're looking at maybe 10 first-order differential equations, right? That are coupled or you're looking at a 10th order differential equation. That's okay. All of this just is the same, basically. And if you understand this first order, you can apply that to higher order circuits. So the next step is I want this to be converted into the frequency domain, which means now let's Laplace transform that differential equation. What do I get when I Laplace transform that differential equation? What happens when I Laplace transform a little V sub I of T that nobody has told me anything about yet? It's just a generic waveform. How do I Laplace transform that? Just make it a big V. And you score, right? So now you have a minus, because you don't know what it is, all you can say is capital V sub I is its Laplace transform. And if somebody gives me a specific little V sub I, I will Laplace transform that and plug it in where capital V sub I of S is. Are we okay with that step? What happens when I Laplace transform the next term? R and C are just constants. They slide out 
of the Laplace transform, and now I simply have to remember how to Laplace transform a derivative. Now I have an s, v sub 0 of s, minus the initial condition on that time domain waveform, little v sub 0 of t. And what happens when I Laplace transform the third term? We don't yet know what that is. We're going to try to solve for that capital V sub 0 of s. Are there questions on that? And if I now say Laplace transform this differential equation, that might be third order. And you need to know how do these initial conditions get incorporated into a third order derivative when you Laplace transform it. You get more initial conditions appearing, don't you? And you get some S's weighting those. You need to know how to use that or do that. Or if you have a second derivative, you can derive all of those if you forgot it on your crib sheet. To put it on your crib sheet, you could derive them all from this first order or first derivative case. You just iterate down to however many derivatives you have. All right, let's keep going. Suppose now that we say, you know what, that capacitor was initially uncharged. So now we can throw away that initial condition, essentially, and we can start collecting common terms. We have two pieces or two terms that involve capital V sub zero of S. We have an S times RC or an RC times S plus one times V sub zero of S and that's equal to, if I move the inputs Laplace transform to the other side, that's now V sub I of S. Just algebra. Questions on where that came from? And now we can create a transfer function. We can now simply find the ratio of the output waveforms Laplace transform divided by the input waveforms Laplace transform. I divide both sides by V sub I of S and I divide both sides by SRC plus 1. Is that okay? And this is what we will call a transfer function. Have we defined transfer functions yet this semester? No? That's what this is. From a differential equation, you can find a transfer function. This is now a transfer function, which is what we're calling capital H of S. This is a transfer function between an input signal, which is what's downstairs on the left-hand side. This input signal is right here. And an output signal. And that's what's upstairs. So we solve for that ratio of transforms, and what's left is our transfer function. And now, if somebody gives me different inputs in the time domain, I don't have to reanalyze the whole circuit, because I know the circuit possesses the exact same transfer function. All I have to do is change the capital V sub I of S each time. They give me a different input. Now, in order to play with this a little bit more, let's just pick some values for R and C, resistor and capacitor. And RC is a time constant. You'll have an RC time constant. Maybe you've heard of that. Suppose that that 
RC time constant is a tenth of a second, one tenth, or it's a hundred milliseconds. That's the time constant. If that's what R and C are, their product, then the transfer function becomes capital H of S equaling 1 over 1 tenth S plus 1, RCS plus 1. And we call this representation, because this was the time constant, and we might even call that tau, this whole transfer function we say is in time constant form. Which means we've normalized all of our factors to have a constant equal to 1. That's something plus 1, and we only have a first order denominator factor. But we can rewrite that. If I factor out the 1 tenth from both terms downstairs, and now if I multiply by 1, which is 10 over 10, now I have exactly the same transfer function, but this form uh, is called the pole zero form. Because now we have explicitly identified pole factors and zero factors. Meaning, from the pole zero form, you should be able to immediately tell me where my poles and zeros, and you need to be able to find poles and zeros of transforms. We haven't talked about transfer functions, but we have talked about ratios of polynomials in S. And if I give you ratios of polynomials in S, then you should be able to tell me what the poles and zeros of that expression are. Where are my zeros? Where are my finite zeros? I do not have any, do I? I do not have any finite values of S that cause the numerator to vanish. So I have no finite zeros. And that could be an exam question, Thursday. Find your poles and zeros of this expression. Where are my zero or where are my poles? Do I have any? I have one pole, don't I? Because that's a first order polynomial in S. It's just an S plus something. I have one pole at S equal to minus 10. That's the value of S that causes that denominator to vanish. Now the power of these transfer functions are just what I said. Now we can use that repeatedly to analyze the output of that low-pass filter for different kinds of inputs. I can now apply different kinds of inputs, little v sub i of t, to that low-pass filter and see what happens. And you can also, with what you know now, figure out the complete solution to that circuit when applying a specific input waveform, v sub i of t. Let's look at the behavior. of that circuit, which is a low-pass filter. And we will understand that even more thoroughly when we start talking about frequency response, Bode plots, etc. But we're getting ready for that now. So the behavior of the circuit to different inputs. What if I apply a constant input? Or what if I let the voltage source, V sub i of t, what if I let that be 5 for t greater than or equal to 0? What's another way of writing that little V sub i of t? It's switching on at zero, isn't it? And what wave or what functional form do we use to switch things on at zero? 
That's the unit step. So we could just say, well, that's just five scaling the unit step. That's exactly the same as what I've written as five for t greater than or equal to zero. What's v sub i of s? This should just roll right off your pencil. It's five over s, right? That's right on your table of Laplace transforms. You can just match these up. Oh, if I have a unit step, I move over to the frequency domain, that's 1 over s. And I have a scaling factor of 5, that's 5 over s. Now we can figure out what our output waveform is going to be. V sub O of s, well, that's just the transfer function H of s times V sub I of s, by definition of how we define that transfer function. Here's our definition of the transfer function. If I multiply now both sides through by V sub I, I have V sub O isolated. And H of S is simply 10 over S plus 10. I now have 10 over S plus 10 times V sub I of S, which is 5 over S. But now for Thursday's exam, what am I going to ask? I'm going to probably ask, what is little v sub 0 of t? If this is capital V sub 0 of s, right? So how do you solve this, or how do you approach this? If you wanted a little v sub 0 of t, can you tell me the structure of little v sub 0 of t without even going any further? You better be able to on Thursday. You should be saying, oh, this is just A over S plus B over S plus 10 because I have two distinct factors or two distinct roots in the denominator polynomial, don't I? And so I can use case one to solve these. And what's A going to be? A is going to be that HV, which is 50 over S plus 10, evaluated at what value of S? Zero. A is 5. What's B? B is 50 over, I cancel the S plus 10 factor, I have the S remaining, and now I evaluate at what value of S? Minus 10, the value of S associated with the B factor. And this now becomes minus 5. So that now you immediately have little v sub 0 of t. That's 5 minus 5 or you could say that that's 5 minus 5 e to the minus 10 t u of t, or you could write that as 5 u of t minus 5 e to the minus 10 t u of t. All of those are your output. So this is what happens when you apply 5 volts to that RC circuit and look at what happens for all time thereafter. What happens at large values of time? T. You low pass filter a constant, what would you expect to see in the lab? If you applied 5 volts to a low pass filter and waited a while, what would you expect to see on your scope? 5 volts. And is that what you see here? Yes. And you could apply the final value theorem, couldn't you? And you wouldn't have had to do all this inverse Laplace transform you could have said, oh, I've gotten this far. Let me just see where I'm going and see if that makes sense. You could say, let me apply the final value theorem. And we're texting, remember, so it's just FVT. That's now this V sub 0 of infinity is equal to the limit 
as s goes to zero of 50s over s plus 10 times s. Is that right? The denominator is well behaved as s goes to 0. And I now have 50 over 10, which is 5, and that's consistent with what my complete solution when I looked at the limit as t went off to infinity. What about the initial value? Can you see the initial value by just looking at v naught of t? Can you let t go to zero from the right? And you'll have 5 minus 5, or 0. And the initial value theorem says that now v sub 0 of 0 plus is this limit as s goes to infinity of 50s over s plus 10s. <laughs> I have 50 over s, or and it's consistent, isn't it? What if I applied to this low-pass filter, what if I put in a sinusoidal input? Do you see how now you could just play with this all day with different inputs, little v sub i of t? since you know how to Laplace transform and you've already analyzed the circuit to the level of finding the transfer function. So that now if I had a sinusoidal input, let's say V sub I of T is now 4 cosine of 3T for non-negative values of time T. What is V sub I of S, capital V sub I of S? Now you just have to remember your transform table of the cosine, right? And that's 4S over S squared plus 3 squared. And now you can say, oh, V sub O of S, that's just 10 over S plus 10 times 4s over s squared plus 3 squared. And what's the structure of your answer? How many terms do you have, potentially? Three. I only see two factors up there. You might have a sine and a cosine, right? From that second order, from that quadratic. So there's two, and then you have your exponential decay due to the pole factor at s plus 10. How would you write your structure for v naught of s? before you take it into the time domain. What's the structure of this? And if you happen to have a calculator that does the expand function, boom, A, B, C can sort of fall right out. You may have to back out C because they probably don't have it times a 3. But you can get it fairly quickly. Questions on that? So that if I, yes? 
Where did the three come from? Anybody want to help? That's the omega. The C, this third term, is my structure of a sine. And the sine is omega over S squared plus omega squared. So I just force that omega to explicitly appear in the numerator. And then I know in the time domain what weights that is just C. So that now I can immediately write in the time domain the structure. Once I found A, B, and C, I know that V sub 0 of T is A e to the minus 10T plus B cosine of 3t plus c sine of 3t, and that's true for non-negative values of time. Questions on that? So you need to be able to do this in your sleep by Thursday, but get plenty of sleep before the exam so you can think more clearly. I'll see you either tonight or Thursday or in office hours tomorrow or Thursday.